When the students of today are the teachers of tomorrow, what will they say about the year 2020? Will this be the year that changed education forever? The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities in education systems everywhere. At the same time, we have all admired the educators, parents, students, and communities that have banded together to meet this challenge. The 12020 Innovation Summit will connect inspiring innovators with educators, researchers, policy leaders, education ministries, students, and parents from around the world. Join us at this free virtual event to share your experiences and learn from like-minded changemakers from over a hundred countries. You will also hear from our global collection of leading innovators in K-12 education who are pioneering solutions that help provide quality education for all, no matter what happens. Register now at www.100.org summit. Hello, good evening, afternoon or morning, depending where you are tuning in to this session. My name is Lasse Leponiemi and I'm the executive director at 100. And I want to welcome you to this 100 special program, uh, remembering Sir Ken Robinson's positive impact on education. In August 2020, Education World lost a remarkable thinker, a man who walked the talk to move the education systems to allow more creativity, to let students be more empowered on their own learning, and changing edu education systems for better. Through his books and talks, he encouraged educators around the world to provide even better educational opportunities for kids. And like Sir Ken's daughter Kate Robinson said at the time of the sorrow, do not bring flowers, bring champagne. So that is our theme of today. Today we are celebrating Sir Ken's impact on the world of education. And I want to start with a personal memory of mine. Uh, a decade ago, I was a high consumer of TED Talks while studying in a university. And one of my dreams was to talk at the TED conference one day. And when I finally got an invitation to talk at the TEDx event uh, here in Finland, that felt like a big win. And while I was rehearsing, I watched Sir Ken's Do School Skill Creativity video over and over again. And so did many others. I believe there is now close to 64 million views on that particular video. And so Sir Ken was a wanted name in all education conferences around the world. And uh, so has been Professor Pasi Salberi traveling a lot in different educational locations and giving presentations around the world. So actually our first presenter in today's session will be Professor Pasi Salperi and um, he will share, among many other things, share a memory from one education conference where he was speaking with Sir Ken. So let's go to the uh, Pasi Salperi.
that was a, my version of uh, the Beatles' uh, revolution. This actually has a story that goes back to um, uh, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, he was um, he was a frequent visitor here in um, in Sydney, and last year um, I had a I had an honor to um, speak in the same conference here in Sydney, and the conference organizers. Um, they came to both of us about the day before the conference and um, they wanted to have a song that we wanted to, uh, each of us separately of course, wanted to um, play when we are invited to the stage. Um, and Ken Robinson said immediately that it's um, uh, the Beatles' revolution number one. And so, so it happened. and. Um, um, of course, anybody who uh, who is familiar with uh, with the Ken's uh, Ken's history and, and uh, time when he was in the school, um, you have heard this story. But uh, this is one of the uh, one of those great stories that Ken often told is that he went to school in Liverpool, um, and in the same school where he went, uh, there was also somebody called uh, Paul McCartney. And, and Ken interviewed uh, Paul for his um, for his book uh, The Elements, um, where the idea was to to see that at, at what which point of time the uh, people like like Paul and um, uh, some other um, significant artists uh, they have realized that they have the particular uh, talents. Um, so so one of the, one of the questions that uh, Ken asked Paul was that uh, did your music teacher in the school um, realize that you, you you have a special talent or something something that may um, may become a big part of uh, his life. And Paul said that no, nobody nobody realized that in the school. Um, uh, and the story goes that uh, there was another person in the in the same school, probably with the same music teacher, called uh, George Harrison. Um, and the same 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 story goes again and 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 again concluded this example that is a good example also, also of the good examples that that he was uh, he was telling about life and education uh, was that uh, can you imagine that uh, there was a teacher probably somewhere in Liverpool in the 1950s who had half of Beatles um, in his or her class and never realized that there's anything anything particular there so um, that's why I wanted to um, uh, really remember uh, Sir Ken Robinson um, with this little uh, little tune, um, and he he also th told things uh, like, uh, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you can never come up with any anything original. And I was this was really a challenge for me to um, you know make mistakes and get things wrong. But uh, in the end, I think things um, uh, things uh, just happen. But I, I really would like to um, uh, just take these few moments to. Um, to remember uh, Ken's uh, work and, and, and his huge legacy on, on people around the world. Um, uh, I am one of those uh, people uh, who have been influenced very, very much by uh, Ken's um, both writings and, uh, and his talks, but also through friendship, his ideas and his, his, his support uh, to my, my my work. Let me just mention a couple of those things. One of the, one of the great ideas um, that really made me think uh, about my own work as a, as an educator, as a teacher, um, as a parent as well, um, is when uh, Ken uh, speaks about human resources crisis, and it links to this uh, example from from Liverpool that we have so many young people going through uh, entire. Um, school years, often 10, 12, 13 years of schooling, without never realizing that they have a that they have a talent, they have something special within them, um, and the fact that so many uh, people go through uh, education system without ever realizing uh, the the creativity and talent and passion that they have is what can uh, often called uh, human resources uh, crisis. And he, he often used the natural resources crisis as an as a analogy here. So, you know, this, this was important for me because I, uh, I started to think about my own, 
uh, own uh, years of uh, being a teacher in Helsinki, Finland. Um, and I was thinking about all those students uh, who many of them actually became something, uh, something special, that they had this talent, but, but the school, uh, including myself, uh, I was teaching mathematics and science uh, for these young people, that we, we, we were not prepared to identify and, and you know, figure out uh, or help these students to, to find their talents and, and their element, as, as Ken uh, is calling that. Um, and when I was uh, about 10 years ago, when I was working on my f the first edition of uh, Finnish Lessons uh, book, um, the, um, the end of the book is really asking this question that how the education system in Finland uh, in the future uh, should change and, and respond to all these uh, uh, changes and challenges. Um, what, what one of those things that I, I really learned from Ken was that the, the school system in Finland and er everywhere else should be designed and redesigned and reformed in a way that it would be doing better job in, in helping each and every young person to realize what their talent is, whether it's a music or mathematics or, or arts or sports, whatever it is. But the, the focus should, not, uh, should be much less on uh, you know, reaching the common standards uh, that can be important as well, but more shifting towards um, helping everyone to realize that they have the world within them uh, and it's often so powerful that it can help you to make a good life for yourself and people around you um, uh, by doing that. The other, uh, the other thing that um, uh, is probably one of those areas that people less uh, connect to um, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, and it's the importance of, uh, of play. And um, this came very concretely to, to my attention uh, in uh, 2016, about five years ago, when, um, when the Lego Foundation, that is one of the strongest uh, and best advocates of uh, play and learning through play, um, decided to uh, give the 2016 Lego Prize uh, to me. And before that, I hadn't really paid that much uh, attention or, or work, worked on, um, on play. But I wanted to see who are the, who are the other people before me who have been awarded uh, this, uh, this very prestigious um, uh, Lego prize. And just five years before that, it was uh, Sir Ken Robinson. And, and that immediately elevated the, uh, uh, the, the, the value and importance of this recognition uh, for me, and it was um, it, it was such an important um, moment uh, in my, my my professional life that I not not only that I wanted to um, see more closely what uh, Sir Ken Robinson uh, thinks about the importance of play and power of play, uh, but what the research and other people uh, have done um, on on that field. So this this is where the um, where my, my work on play really started and, and, and uh, Ken has been really a kind of an influential guiding uh, mentor uh, in many ways uh, for me in, in that research and, and writing. And, um, and this book um, that was uh, published uh, last year, Let the Children Play, uh, we are so honored to have a foreword from uh, uh, Sir Ken Robinson here. And, and what a wonderful way of writing he, uh, he again uh, is showing in this, uh, this little piece that is a kind of a lead to this um, uh, work that we, uh, we spend many years uh, uh, to uh, kind of a gain a better understanding why play is, uh, play is important. I think the value that, uh, that Ken really brings into this play conversation uh, is his very pragmatic way of um, uh, first of all, reminding all of us adults that that play is uh, it's a it's a kind of a natural uh, form of uh, children's and adults' lives as well. He often said that um, that play is how we manifest ourselves as human beings. Human beings is a is a, is a human condition, uh, and um, and simply because of that fact, it's a, it's an important thing. Uh, uh, Ken was really uh, worried about the decline of play. Um, that the children are playing much less than they, they used to. It's exactly the same uh, similar conclusions that we have uh, made in our own research and in this book. Um, and, um, you know, his, um, his advice to uh, the educators and parents and policymakers and, and others was simply to play 
uh, more. Uh, Ken was using the word real play that for him meant uh, free, unstructured outdoor play that also for me now is the, the highest, highest order, the, the kind of an ideal form of play whenever you can do that. Uh, just, um, uh, you know, go, go, outdoors and, uh, go, go outdoors and play. Uh, but, you know, overall, uh, when I think about um, uh, Ken Robinson and his contribution to, uh, to education, uh, creativity, uh, learning, um, future of schooling and, and many other things, um, is simply this, that he had an extraordinary skill, an ability, ability that very few people actually in my trade uh, has uh, to communicate complex ideas of education and, and learning and, and creativity and change in a way that people understood what he was saying. He was able to communicate to uh, wide range of audiences, not just educators and, and like-minded people, but he was able to speak the language uh, that everybody understood. Just as an example, just to look at his, um, uh, his, his speech or talk when he's talking about the, the, para the two paradigms in education and how, how is it important to shift from this standardization paradigm to the uh, creativity. In 12 minutes, he's able to uh, you know, put all this information and not just uh, throw the information to the audience, but organize it in a way that it's easy to understand and accept and agree. And that's why probably uh, there are so many individual people, there are thousands of teachers around the world, school leaders, there are in entire districts um, uh, and communities that have been influenced by his, his words and his thinking and clarity of ideas uh, for, the, um, uh, for the change. I have been particularly uh, honored also to um, know Ken Robinson uh, for many years and, and uh, work with him in different parts of the world. Um, and, you know, one of those things that has really touched me and um, I appreciate a lot his, uh, his help in my, my work and our books uh, that we have been publishing about play and education. Um, I would like to uh, close here by uh, just mentioning that he um, he's um, um, afterwards <laughs> that we we call it in uh, uh, in my Finnish lessons book is something that uh, speaks very um, kind of a clearly again okay, about his personality and uh, and and visionary way of uh, seeing things. Let me just read the last last words that he wrote. Uh, to my book that will come out uh, in a moment. He's writing here, and this is not going to take long, but just, just to give you an idea uh, what he's saying. Uh, for the past 15 years, Ken writes, uh, Finland has been well ahead of the curve of education. The rest of the world has much to learn from these Finnish lessons. One of the most important lessons is that this story is still evolving and is far from over. And so is the story of uh, Sir Ken Robinson. It's not over, it's evolving. And uh, many of us, including me, um, we will be working for his legacy and um, making sure that these ideas that often became far ahead of uh, the time um, will be remembered and will have an impact um, in the future. So this. Um, these little thoughts um, and words um, go to the memory of a uh, great friend, champion, um, l revolutionary, Sergen Robinson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pasi, for, for those words and, and, and for especially the, the playing the guitar in the beginning. I think it has taken far too long. Uh, since we got into the rock and roll uh, during our 100 Innovation Summit this year. And uh, you were mentioning as a part of your presentation that uh, the play is, is a human condition. And uh, I tend to believe that it also leads to a passion and purpose. And, and as a young, young person, the passion and purpose is something that you are seeking for and you want to find your own way in this world. Uh, in the US, we have this beautiful organization called the Future Project. And uh, 
they are a community that helps young people to find their passion and purpose in, in their life. And now uh, when the pandemic situation has hit the world hard, uh, they have been transmitting their work in a future life, uh, which is more online kind of like approach. And um, it's easy to believe that also Sir Ken uh, was a dear advocate for them and was participating to the work they were doing and helping them to get forward with, with the work they are doing for the community of young people. So today we have a pleasure to have the co-founder Kanya Balakrishna from the Future Project and Future Live to join us live uh, and share his memory of Sir Ken Robinson and the work they have been doing together. So over to you, over to you Kanya. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I am um, sorry that I am not gonna be able to play the guitar and bring some rock music to this event, but I'm so honored to be here and um, to share some of the biggest lessons that Sir Ken Robinson, such an extraordinary human being and thought leader, um, some of the lessons that he shared with me over the last several years. So as Lasse mentioned, I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of The Future Project. Uh, a US-based youth empowerment organization uh, dedicated to a world in which every young person, regardless of their background or their circumstance, can discover their element and to le and learn to pursue their passion and their purpose um, and realize their full potential in the world. Um, and like so many of you and tens of thousands of other social entrepreneurs and educators and parents and many more across the world, um, Sir Ken fundamentally shaped the trajectory of my life and my career. Um, I met Sir Ken for the first time about five years ago, but it was about five years before that, shortly after the famous TED Talk that many have already alluded to, um, that this uh, fundamental uh, trajectory shift started to happen. Um, I was so inspired by Sir Ken's ideas and his conviction um, and his worldview that I decided with uh, my co-founder and partner Andrew to dedicate my life to them. Um, we, you know, we started asking ourselves, much like Sir Ken taught us, that you know everything starts with good questions. We start asking ourselves uh, many of the questions that he sparked in his books and in his talks. You know, what would it really look like for every young person to discover their element? Um, how could this actually happen? You know, what if students? woke up every day inspired and excited to go to school? And what if every adult uh, that worked with them every day um, knew how to help them find their element and realize their full potential? So it was these questions um, that led us to start the Future Project. And in many ways, and sometimes without even realizing it, honestly, the Future Project you know, has been something of an ode to Sir Ken, a manifestation of his, of his vision and his, a translation of his ideas into tangible programs and experiences for young people, like I know so many of you um, do in your classrooms and in your communities as well. Um, so Sir Ken taught me many, many things over the years, uh, but today I'd like to share three of the biggest lessons that he taught me, and uh, not just in an attempt to remember him, although um, he is worth remembering, his legacy is worth honoring, uh, but really to honor him in the way that I knew he would want most, which is by passing along his lessons and his inspiration to as many people as far and wide as possible. Um, so the first lesson is simple, um, but and it's utterly profound, and it's it's you know very similar to what you just heard from Posse um, over the last ten minutes or so, which is uh, that every young person is a miracle. Um, every one of them deserves the opportunity to find their element and to live a full and purposeful life. Um, to realize their full potential in life. Uh, there's a lot, as we all know, um, especially today, that is broken in the world that's not working. But Sir Ken's vision and work reminds us, reminded me always, um, that people are whole, that we have everything that we need inside us, um, that we have the power to create the life, uh, to create the world that we imagine, that we want to see, and that, um, that we as a society have an obligation and a responsibility um, to support young people, to support every child um, in making sure that they can discover this too, that they know that they have this right and that they can, um, they can live the life that they want to live and create the world that they want to see. Uh, everything, you know, starts with that belief in my view. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with this group, um, but that, you know, it, that belief that children are not just inherently curious and creative, 
um, but that they're extraordinarily powerful. And if we train them and support them and unleash that power and that potential, the world would be an extraordinary place. And every one of them, um, every every person would be able to grow up um, and live, you know, the most um, the life that they want to live, whatever that looks like. So that's that's lesson one, and it's the most fundamental one, the most foundational one, and it's one I imagine that um, all of you watching right now, and again, millions of other people across the world have internalized because of Sir Ken as well. The second question, the second lesson is uh, is more about us actually, those of us dedicated um, who have dedicated ourselves, our lives, our careers to the miracle business, as he called it, the work of supporting um, the miracle that is every young person. The reality is that there are thousands of adults, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands across the world in schools and communities who want to serve young people who are already serving young people um, in all kinds of different ways. And what Sir Ken you know, taught me is that we are the system. I think a lot of us think about and talk about um, how we might change schools and other institutions that serve youth because they're not always doing it in the way that, you know, we believe is most uh, needed and right for young people. Uh, but the reality is that we have the power to change it and to, and to do so every day in the work that we do, um, we do with children in, in classrooms and in communities and organizations in hospitals and, and many more beyond. Um, so we've taken all this to heart in a really big way at the Future Project. Um, you can see this photo that I have of Sir Ken with some members of our team um, in 2016 in New York City. Um, but this idea, this idea that we, those of us who've dedicated ourselves to young people, to the miracle that they are, um, that we have this power led to our first big insight or innovation at the Future Project. So um, we invented a few years ago a new role in society and in schools that we call the Dream Director. Um, I imagine that many of you um, watching this right now, our dream directors um, in your own right. But the the, the idea is, we, you know, we recognize that, you know, there's so many of us who want to serve. And no matter what the narrative is, um, uh, whether school, you know, school has been designed for a different time, that, you know, we're not, that it's not conspiring to support young people in developing their creativity in the way that, that we believe it must, um, that all of us um, could do something about it every day. Um, so, so we went out over the last several years and we looked for uh, educators and entrepreneurs and coaches and artists and people who had dedicated their lives in different ways to young people. And we asked them to serve as dream directors. We recruited them, we trained them, um, we embedded them in schools across the US, um, across you know, dozens of different communities. And they coached students, they worked directly with young people, high school age students to dream up and build what we call future projects. Um, projects that channel their passion and purpose, um, that give them an opportunity to play and um, imagine um, and and turn them all into something tangible, turn their vision into something tangible that um, that made a real difference in their communities or in their world, even, even if the difference was very small. Um, and the Dream Directors also worked in collaboration with the adults in the building, with the teachers, with the principals, with the administrators, to help them build a culture that was safe and inspiring and welcoming and creative for students. Um, and, you know, the reality is that uh, that the, the recognition that there is this group of people, uh, people dedicated to the futures of young people um, that Sir Ken had was um, not just affirming, but it's actually revolutionary in many ways. As 100, the organization, you know, that we're all here because of knows mo better than most the power that exists when we nurture and cultivate the creativity, the imagination, um, the potential for collaboration uh, among dream directors. And I say that you know, in a, with like a lowercase d, with dream, we're all dream directors um, in many ways, um, not just the people who worked, you know, worked and work for the Future Project. Um, the idea that when we, when we unleash the innovation and the creativity of that group of people, uh, the probability that young people across the world will realize their potential grows exponentially. And that to me is such an exciting idea. If you, if you empower the people who can empower young people, um, then, you know, then the, then the ripple effect is, you know, is, is fast and it's, um, and it's potentially huge. And that's, um, I think an extraordinary insight that Sir Ken had and that he, he taught me, he, you know, he, he didn't want us to sit around and wait for someone else to fix the system at the end of the day. Like, yes, he talked to, you know, people in all kinds of positions of power, but at the end of the day, he wanted all of us, each of us to realize that we have that power and that we are the ones that we've been waiting for um, and, and that we can help young people to find their full potential every day in the work that we do. 
So that's, that's lesson two. Finally, lesson three, which is maybe my favorite of the three that I'm going to share because it evokes Sir Ken most as a human being um, and uh, makes me think most viscerally about him, which is that we have to walk the talk. Um, those of us engaging in this work, whatever role we're playing, um, we have to discover our element. We have to realize our potential. We have to tap into our imagination, into our creativity, into our power to be innovators every day. Um, in fact, it's interesting. The first time I met Sir Ken, I have another picture here to show you. The first time I met him was not even in the context of education. Um, we were uh, actually all speaking together at a conference um, uh, in the Midwest, in the U.S., and he was talking with a big company um, about creativity in the workplace. And the audience was just captivated by the idea that no matter their roles, whether they were you know, selling mortgages or whatever, they, they had the power um, to be creative and to be innovators and to make change um, in their um, in their workplace. And um, and that idea that we can all we could all be innovators and be creative no matter what role um, we were taking on in the world you know, has been really important to, to me actually as a, as a leader and as um, as a person creating a culture um, within the Future Project and in other communities that I'm in, um, that we had to sort of take our own medicine, the, the, um, that what we were trying to instill in young people had to be instilled in ourselves. And um, as Lasse mentioned, the, um, the pandemic was a, um, a big catalyst for, uh, for sort of the, the, the wake up call that we all need to, that we can be innovators, that we must be innovators, we must bring imagination to our work every day. Uh, when everything changed overnight for us, as I know it did for um, for all of you probably in different ways uh, back in the spring, um, we couldn't work in schools in person anymore. And, you know, we kind of stepped back as a team and we said, you know, what what do we do? You know, do we just wait it out? Do we, do we hope that this goes away um, soon and we'll be able to get back to what we are doing? Um, but, but what happened actually is that um, our students came to us. And if you listen to them, if we listen to young people, we all know that they'll tell you what they need. And so they came to us and they said, you know, we can't believe we're telling you this, but we miss school. We miss the connections and the people that care about us. And we miss the opportunities to do things that matter to us. And, um, and so, you know, we realized that the only thing we could do um, was to try to rise to the occasion and try to bring our creativity as a team to the work um, in a whole new way. And so that's what led us um, to launch uh, Future Live, this new uh, virtual offering for young people. Uh, we see it as a digital empowerment platform. We're trying to do what we did in schools, but in a way that you know actually can be much more accessible to young people over time. Um, so a platform that allows you know young people to join a global community and get access to live sessions um, where they get to explore their passion and purpose with the coaching of a dream director, um, on-demand content um, from, from people all across the world who want to teach young people lessons, um, and um, an on-demand coaching from dream directors, from mentors, from people in the community, from teachers who um, who can support them as they're facing challenges um, or having insights and breakthroughs as they pursue the things that matter most to them. Um, so we piloted Future Live with 100, several hundred students over the last several months, and now we're preparing to open the platform to several thousand and then hopefully several million um, children, young people all across the world. Um, so I share that story, um, you know, as an example of us having to internalize and express in our culture um, the commitment to innovation, to creativity, to imagination that Sir Ken stood for. Um, but to me, his um, his message, his lesson to walk the talk extends actually far beyond that. Um, to tell you the truth, I may have never met anyone who embodies their vision and who walks their talk more than Sir Ken. Um, and you know, the, the photo that just popped up in that in that photo was Sir Ken, uh, me, Andrew, uh, my co-founder, one of our dream directors, and a few of our students. And I remember so viscerally from that moment um, how much he, um, how interested he was in us, um, in our ideas and our imaginations, um, in, in the young people that he was meeting. Um, he loved and embraced everyone. He put us at ease. Um, when he met us, like we were all tongue tied and starstruck and, um, you know, amazed to be meeting this person who we had heard about and learned about and read about um, for so many years. And he um, never made us feel like he was 
any different than any of us, that, that we were as important, that our ideas were as valid um, as this extraordinary man who had been knighted and who has still the most watched TED Talk of all time. Um, he's, he was witty and funny and um, and just genuinely curious at all times about everything around him, whatever the setting, the content, the moment. Um, I watched him, you know, make time for people, whether they were trying to get a book signed in a book line or, you know, attending an a, a event or a dinner. Um, he treated all of us, um, especially those of us who were doing this work, who were in the miracle business, as he said, um, as people who were worth listening to and um, and interacting with, no matter how busy he was. Um, and as a result of, of that, um, and, and of course, of his extraordinary vision and his ideas, you know, he showed me uh, me personally, you know, not just a path for my life and my career, um, but what it means to and what it looks like to be an ambitious and brilliant and influential person, um, but also a person who is always full of humanity and humor um, and, and levity and lightness and kindness, which um, is just sadly far too rare in the world to find both of those things, brilliance, ambition, influence and kindness, humanity, humor in the same person and for that person to be the same person whether they're on stage um or you know they're sitting sitting with you at a bar or wherever um is an extraordinary thing he made made people feel seen uh, worthy important and um at the very least he always made me feel that way so um so thank you sir ken robinson for everything that you've done for our field for our work for for our ideas um but also thank you for who you were and uh, for what you instilled in every single one of us as a result. I will always be grateful for that. Thank you, Kania, and thank you for being one of the miracles out there, uh, doing the work every day uh, with the other miracle workers being part of your team. Um, and thanks for sharing those three, three things uh, or three kind of like um, recommendations or memories you had about Sir Ken. And as we have been walking at the talk here at 100, uh, we have been doing many, many things always in hundreds. So we are selecting 100 innovations to our global collection. We have been trying to reach over 100 amb ambassadors uh, and so forth. And in 2016, we were also filming uh, 100 education stakeholders around the world. So we were traveling from one place to another to film uh, in a new location and, and, and to get these uh, figureheads and these education stakeholders to tell to us what they would like to get from the future of education. And I can fully relate to Kania saying that it was always, uh, it was always so easy to be around uh, with Sir Ken and, and that he was always cracking jokes. So in 2016 we were in LA and our purpose was to do this interview with Sir Ken and, and somewhere midway through the interview, we actually noticed, I was asking from the film crew that what, what, is the red, what is the red light blinking on the right upper corner? And then they realized like, oh man, there is no memory card installed. And, and in that moment, Sir Ken just replied and said that, well, the repetition is the mother of all learning. And we did the full interview from the beginning to the end. Um, so next we are going to show you some highlights from those in the, from that interview set, a session we had with Sir Ken. And actually that is one of the rare cases where uh, Kate Robinson has been interviewing her father. So please enjoy for the next four minutes. The role of education is to help students to learn. And the people who do that are not the policy makers or the superintendents, it's the teachers who do that. So the heart of education is the relationship between teachers and learners. That's what it's about. And everything else should be focused on making that the best relationship possible. And the problem is that over time, all kinds of things have got in the way of it.
trying to improve education, trying to transform it, trying to get good work in great schools, isn't some unfathomable mystery like curing certain diseases seems to be. We kind of know what works. I mean, there are great places all around the world already doing it. Uh, the problem lies in the insistence of some policymakers, I think, uh, that everything has to be done in the same way, that they, they are promoting a kind of homogeneity and really interesting learning environments are not homogeneous, they're diverse and they, they adapt and they change and they are suited to different sorts of purposes. There's freedom to move, there's freedom to use different sorts of materials, freedom to collaborate and to interact with other people um, and to work on projects as well as to work quietly on, on theoretical tasks. So uh, the best learning environments are the ones that do that, they embody the variety of learning. We asked one of the teachers if he would direct it and he agreed to do that. And uh, it went very well. And the following year we did another one. It came up a third time and we said to him, would you direct it? And he said, you know, I can't, I haven't got time to do it. And then he said, so, you know, I, I did say I couldn't direct the play this year, but I do have a suggestion, I think Ken should direct it. Well, I nearly passed out because it had never crossed my mind that I could direct a play or that anyone in the group would agree to it. I just didn't feel I had that relationship with them. I thought, no, the director is somebody who has to preside over this whole thing. But they all just looked around and said, great idea, great. And I was terrified. But you know, I learned a long time ago that you shouldn't walk away from things that trouble you. you know, the best way to deal with the fear is to go straight towards it and try and get hold of it. Partly because of that experience and probably doing what I do now can be traced back to some extent to that little divergent point. And if he'd not said, will you direct the play, I'd probably be running a bar somewhere now in Warrington. If you recognise that it is a human system that's dynamic and is changing, it makes the, the task more plausible. So I always say to teachers, uh, if they ask me, they say, how can I change the system? Well, the first thing is to recognise that you are the system, that everyone in the system is a manifestation of the system. So if you change what you do, you are changing the system. And the interesting thing about this to me is that there is much more room for innovation in the system as it is than very many people seem to realize. Conquering fear is one of the key, key skills you have to learn when you are a young one. And uh, like Sir Ken mentioned in the video, uh, that was also something that he was struggling through when, when doing the play at his school. And to be able to do so, you have to be learning socio-emotional skills to know like how you are feeling, what kind of things you are going through within yourself and how you are able to deal with the choice of the life, but also with the more stressful situations. And um, to this, uh, next session, we have a great, great pleasure to invite uh, Dido Balla uh, from Goldie Harm Foundation and MindUp organization to tell a little bit more about the work they have been doing exactly on that field. How they have been giving tools for teachers to Im implement mindfulness in the classrooms and helping young people, the students in the school, to be more secure in themselves. So let's invite Director of Educational Innovation and Partnership, Dido Balla, to the States. Thank you so much, and I'm so happy to be here. And what I find interesting about this is that I have actually never met Sir Ken Robinson, but that's why this is even more impactful to me because I learned from him very directly one important lesson in my life, which is that we need to lean into our curiosity and lead with our curiosities. I grew up in Cameroon in West Africa, which is like 6,000 miles away from where I am right now um, in Florida. And as a kid, I was somebody who always leaned into my curiosity by instinct, but I always got in trouble for that. So I was never conforming, I was never in a box. So when all the kids knew who they wanted to be when they grew up, I said I had no idea. When they said do things this way, which was straight and linear, I wanted to zigzag. 
And that's why, for example, as a kid, I thought I didn't like math, that's why I hated math. And the reason why I felt that way is because I was taught to do math one way, in a linear way, with a formula. And my brain always looked at math very differently. But every time I did math a different way than the formula, my teacher got me in trouble. And that got me feeling as if I wasn't good enough. But my instinct to follow curiosity and lead with curiosity didn't change. And as a result, I went to a few steps that led me to leave Cameroon, travel to multiple countries throughout Africa and, and go to school there, and ultimately travel and move into the U.S. Um, where I currently live. And when I first heard Sirkin Robinson talking about curiosity and creativity, I felt almost as if somebody had given me permission, authorization to actually authentically lead with that. And that completely changed my life in terms of everything I did then from an education standpoint as a teacher with my students, allowing them to be who they are, to smile, to laugh, to joke in the classroom, to be their whole selves, um, to who I was professionally and just kind of growing from one career to the other. And that's how I ended up working for MindUp, which was founded by Goldie Hawn in 2003. What's also interesting about this is that Goldie was known back then as a movie star, an award-winning actress. And when she decided to also lean into her curiosity and come up with a program in education that would focus on neuroscience, that would focus on positive psychology, that would focus on mindful awareness and on just teaching kids how to be present in the moment and self-regulate, many people had questions about that and said, that's interesting. Why is she leaning into something like that? People think linearly, but she also was thinking in zigzags and said, I'm a dancer, I'm an actress, but I want to be in education now because I want to make the world a better place. She leaned into that. And it also happens to be that Sir Ken Robinson is friends with Goldie and was actually one of our board members for Mind Up. So she pursued that curiosity and led with that curiosity. And as a result, we have a program now called Mind Up that has those four pillars, which are teaching kids how to understand neuroscience. How does the brain work? If you can understand what triggers you, what makes you feel upset, anxious, scared, and you can realize that there are ways to self-regulate, then you can learn better because a happier brain can learn better anyway. That's the first pillar. Second one is social and emotional learning, which is we are holistic beings. You aren't just a student in a classroom. You aren't just a teacher in a classroom. You aren't just a CEO. You are a whole person with a full experience that is impacting you from before you do your job and after your job. So same thing with the kids. If we can look at them holistically, we'd be able to tap into exactly who they are and teach them how to lean with that curiosity as well. The third pillar is positive psychology. So we have been teaching kids all around the world how to shift their perspective. You don't control what happens to you, but you control how you respond to it. And we found that if kids can learn how to shift perspective from, hmm, I'm not in control of what's happening to me, but if I react this way, if I scan the world looking for the positive, for the hopeful, for the optimistic, then I can actually live a more fulfilling life as well. And we find that kids are learning from these skills and they are able to self-regulate to see the world better as well. And fourth pillar is mindful awareness, which is a long time ago when Goldie started this program, again, in addition to being questioned about who she was to lead into uh, education, the idea of mindfulness was not very accepted then yet. And yet she was a visionary who saw that learning how to do one thing at a time, how to listen mindfully, how to taste mindfully, how to be present with somebody would actually change the world, and it has. So we teach kids that if you learn how to be mindful with what you do, you can be more fulfilling, more, more productive, and actually uh, realize the goals that you have. So those are the four pillars we spread all around the world. My life as a kid who left Cameroon, didn't think I liked math, didn't know if I could be an entrepreneur or if I could be okay not knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up. And thinking about Goldie, who in 2003 as an actress said, I want to change the world and create a, a curriculum that kids can use to self-regulate. All those things are going along with Sir Ken Robinson's message of you need to have a learning revolution. And if you want to change the system, you are the system, so change yourself. So what I've been doing what Goldie has been doing 
is directly co-signed by that message of you are the system. And as a result, right now with Mind Up, to date, we have brought these principles into more than 14 countries around the world. We have impacted 170,000 teachers and educators around the world and up to 7 million children. And all those things happen just because instead of feeling as if we had to fit in a box, instead of feeling as if we had to be linear, we embraced zigzagging and we are embracing the fact that in order to change the world right now, we are going to keep leaning into that creativity that Sirkin Rapperson talks about. I want to close with gratitude and remind myself and everybody here is that one thing that we teach kids to remind up is that you need to be grateful for what you have, especially right now with COVID happening. There are so many reasons why there are things that aren't working for us. And we know that our brain has a negativity bias. So we tend to focus on what's not working. We want to shift that a little bit, acknowledge what's not working, work on fixing that because you are the system like Sir Ken Robinson said, but also focus on the things that make you grateful. And I want to remind myself and all of us here that being a human being is something to be grateful for. Being healthy is enough to be grateful for. And if you are wondering if you are able to be the change in the system, remember again, you are a human being. We are the people who are designing uh, machines that are flying. We are changing education. We are changing technology. You can do it as well. Sirkin Robinson's work needs to continue. That's what he would want. So if you are wondering if it should be somebody else, if you should think about contacting that person and calling somebody else, realize that the message here is that you are the change yourself. So don't wait for somebody else because if not you, then who would it be? And if not now, when would it be? Go ahead and be the change that you want to see. Thank you. A topic that I have been thinking about recently is does it have the same power when you do something good for somebody else and you share it so that others can witness it versus when you do it in public or, or in private? So I've seen people ask online if that person is doing good things, why they're recording themselves, why they're sharing. And this is what I think about that when it comes to how the brain works. So we have these parts of our brain called mirror neurons, which is the ones that are at work when you ask somebody, for example, hey, look at your friend and smile as big as you can and ask them to stare at you for 15 seconds, but they aren't allowed to smile. Try it at home. Have somebody do it and see. Usually, most people can't do it, right? Just watching somebody smile genuinely makes you want to smile as well. And then in three seconds, five seconds, everybody's laughing and smiling. The reason why that happens is because your brain is designed to mimic, to mirror emotions and actions from people around you. That's why if you are meeting with somebody and having a conversation, try to mimic their behavior um, or watch the way they're behaving. You're going to see that sometimes you start behaving like them or they start behaving like you. If you go like this, next thing you know, they're doing that too. When you nod, somebody starts nodding. So our brains are wired to actually copy each other. And so when I think about acts of kindness, and being kind to other people, when somebody else is witnessing it, you're helping the person that you helped, but the people who watched it are compelled to also do something kind for somebody else, right? Paid forward. Like if you go to Starbucks and somebody who was in line in front of you decides to pay for you without thinking about it, your brain wants you to then pay for the person behind you. That's why it's a thing. So. I think that ultimately the act of kindness matters individually but having witnesses sharing with other people is actually amplifying the kindness it's actually maximizing the impact you can have on more people so ultimately I would say if you are genuinely doing acts of kindness there is nothing wrong with sharing them in fact our brains were designed to copy each other so the more people can witness it your kids, your friends, your family, your colleagues, the more people are going to copy that and be kind to others. So don't be shy about sharing your act of kindness.
Thank you, Dida. And I think kindness and tolerance are something that we very, very much need uh, these days in the world. Um, when 100 was uh, founded in 2015, uh, we also started to work together with, with Kate Robinson at that time. And uh, during the forming years of, of 100's work, I could say that we were not that mindful about focusing only on one thing at a time. Uh, we wanted to explore and understand the education world more in depth. And um, we had many travels to film those interviews I mentioned earlier. And I have many, many stories from those years. For example, mentioning one from, I believe it was 2015, uh, when we were going into Singapore. And uh, we had ordered a van to pick us up from the airport. The only thing what we did not realize with Saku was that it was actually a van meant for taking different kind of equipment from one place to another so there were no seating available at all. So then Kate was like a princess uh, traveling on the front seat of the van and we were with Saku in the back section of the van with all the camera equipment and it was maybe like 35 degrees so it was one sweaty ride from the airport to the hotel. And I believe that many other good things also happened during that uh, visit to Singapore and uh, some of those then led into a happy family news later. Um, when we are now kind of like coming to the conclusion of this uh, Sir Ken Robinson tribute uh, session uh, and something what we have been discussing with Kate al al also before is that uh, how we are able to keep the Sir Ken's work going forward is one of the key questions and how we can make even the impact bigger in the world in the future. And now I want to give this virtual stage to Kate. So go ahead, Kate. Thank you, Lasse. For this, um, I want to uh, say a, a really big thank you to 100 for organizing this tribute to my dad. Um, quite honestly, I wish that we weren't here doing this at all today. Um, you know, I wish the circumstances that led us to be meeting here today hadn't happened, um, but they have. And I'm so grateful for um, well, the support we've had from our global community and our global family, um, and especially for this today by hundreds. So thank you. Um, I had a lovely ride in Singapore from the airport to the hotel. <laughs> there was nothing wrong in the front seat whatsoever. Um, and as Lasse alluded to, that was the trip where I met my husband. Um, so it's, you know, some of um, well, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the core team in the early years of 100. And um, I can say with my hand on my heart that they, they changed the course of my life. Um, so it, it feels very fitting and um, well, deeply sad, but deeply wonderful to be here today with 100 honoring my dad. Um, I'd like to thank Azal Pasi for um, well, not just for the incredible guitar song, um, which I didn't realize you could play. So that was an added bonus. Um, but for your beautiful words and for sharing what dad meant to you and to Kanye and Dido as well for sharing your tributes and for talking a bit about the work that you do that was in part inspired by him. Um, for those of you watching Mind Up and The Future Project were, were projects that were incredibly close to dad's heart and ones that he supported in various ways over the past several years and ones that we will carry on supporting. Um, so I know MindUp's been a part of the 100 community for a little while, um, but do, if you can, go and check out MindUp and the Future Project afterwards. Um, please forgive me if I'm a little bit emotional during this. It's been, um, speaking amongst friends, it's been a horrible few months. Uh, 2020 really is the year that keeps on giving. Um, I'm aware as I look at grief that it's like a mountain and that I am painfully towards the bottom of it. Um, but it is through actually tributes like this and through connecting with people and through the knowledge of carrying on his legacy that I think I, I personally will be able to climb the mountain. Um, my father was a remarkable man, which I know is what you're supposed to say, but in his case is absolutely true. Um, he was kind. He was incredibly good, was good-hearted, 
Um, he was funny, as you know, and he was so wise. Even in his last days, he was imparting wisdom that have kept me strong over the past few months since he hasn't been here. Um, I was often asked, I am often asked what he was like in real life. And the truth is, as Kanye mentioned, he was exactly the same in person as he was on stage because the man on stage wasn't a carefully curated alter ego or an act. It was him. He was the same at the breakfast table as he was on stage. The, um, the response that we had when we announced his death from people all around the world was um, overwhelming in a good way at a very difficult time. But quite aside from the, res the, the amount of responses we had, something stood out to me, which was people from all over the world shared stories about meeting him, whether they met him um, at an event, at a book signing, or if they met him at the airport or bumped into him. They met him and he made them feel like they were the only person in the room. And it's the kind of thing that if he'd been around to see those messages and we wished so much that he was, but he would have remembered the person who'd left the message and he would have remembered the story of how they met. And he would have because to him in that moment, they were the only person in the room. You know, it wasn't, it again, it wasn't an act. Um, he genuinely, truly cared about people. He cared, he was interested. He cared about people's stories, about who they were and why they were that way, what they were doing, you know, what their parent or their dog thought of what they were doing. And he remembered every story. And I think there's, well, it's just worth pausing on that for a second because it's such a rare feat, I think, to have created such a platform like he did and to have had such an impact the way he did um, on authenticity, on, on, on being sincere. You know, the reason... His message spread was, of course, because of his message, of what he said. But it was also, I think, because of how he said it, because of who he was in, in saying it, that it resonated the way that he did. Um, in processing my grief and in working on his legacy, which is what I would like to talk to you about today, I've been rereading his books and his early work and his writing. And um, there's a huge comfort in that. It's, you know, he wrote in the same way he spoke. So it's like hearing his voice all the time. Um, but what really struck me when I was reading it, is quite aside from actually just how long he has been, you know, he fought for the things that he believed in. I was reading reports that came out in the early 80s, you know, that are painfully relevant to do with uh, the importance of arts education, that are painfully relevant to today. But what, what overwhelmed me when I was reading it was, just his love for, for humanity, his love for our potential as a species, for our creative capacities. Um, I really believe that he saw the best in humanity and he wanted the best for humanity at his core. His message was a rallying cry for us to live up to our greatest potential. And I think we will need those more than ever. The, you know, his, his, Death was um, well, incredibly sad for a number of reasons, certainly for me personally and for my family, but I think globally, because there was, there has never been a more important time in modern history and living history for his message. Um, you know, I think we've been building up to, to the point in history that we're at for a long time. We've been sleepwalking past warning signs of, um, you know, breakdowns and suicide rates and, toxic systems that we take for granted because we've always done things that way. And even before the pandemic, we were coming up to a crossroads, but certainly in light of the pandemic, we have found ourselves as an international community really at the crossroads. Um, and as we face not only you know, the duration of this pandemic and how long it may go on for, but certainly the impact it will have, we will need our creative capacity more than ever. There was a quote that I read recently, one of the amazing things uh, from the tributes is there've been all these quotes that he said that people have been sharing that I had missed or that just seemed so appropriate. But one of them was, um, the more complex the world becomes, the more creative we need to be to meet its challenges. And certainly the world is very complex at the moment. The good thing is that we do have these creative capacities. We do have our human potential. It's what dad said, what he wrote um, 
separated us from the rest of the life on earth that you know in many ways we were similar to life on earth but we unlike the rest of life on earth we have these incredible powers of imagination that we create the reality in which we live that we create that we collaborate um other animals other species on earth don't have elaborate language systems the way that we do they don't create works of art or musical symphonies they don't have elaborate democratic systems like the ones currently being tested in the US uh, that's that's what we do as humanity our our time on earth has never been static and it's evolved not just because of external influences the way that other species evolve but because of the systems and the cultures that we create and that we put in place you know we truly create the realities in which we live um he would say and actually you saw that in in the video interview uh, that we did in Los Angeles with 100 which um actually was the only time I got to interview him and uh, quite aside from that story of the memory card um we we kept trying not to giggle <laughs> the whole way through because we'd never sat like that just facing each other having a conversation him on camera and me off camera and um, so it's one of my happiest memories that day but he said in that video that you know education is a human system that if you are a part of the system then you are the system um, and I know Dido referenced that as well, which means that it can be changed. It's not easy to change it, but as a human system, it can evolve to suit the needs of the world that it is designed to serve. So certainly as we're at this, this turning point, I believe, I know he believed in human history, but his work wasn't finished. Um, his death was sudden and unexpected and he wasn't finished. Um, his work still isn't finished. And um, in his final days, I promised him that I would dedicate the rest of my life to his memory, uh, to his legacy. And um, I meant it. And I, I know you've heard, uh, we've heard, you know, from, from 100 and from Passi and from Kanya and Dido, I know that I'm not alone in carrying out his legacy. I know that, well, for starters, his legacy was his. He, he built an incredible legacy whilst he was still with us. And it's a human legacy. It's international it's dedicated it's passionate it's committed um and what i would like to ask you today is if you would join me in carrying on his legacy we have so much work to do um he used to say and actually i'd recommend you check out his unite talk that he did his call to unite talk which actually was an initiative that kanye was involved with but he used to say that great farmers know that to get the best results you focus on the soil not on the plant they get the conditions right. And he used to say that if you get the conditions right in education, miracles happen. And if you call it a miracle, it sounds like it, it's a rare thing, but actually in education, miracles happen every single day. Um, I believe that's actually at the core of what 100 does. It creates the conditions for miracles to happen. It connects, it connects people, um, innovate, and it, it, it connects innovations. Um, it connects the community of those of us who believed in dad. If he... If anything he said resonated with you, if he lit a spark inside of you, um, the way you certainly did for me, then we have a duty, I believe, to carry that spark and light it in somebody else and raise his light and his message higher. He would say, and he did say, that um, you know he wasn't alone in this either, that his work was, was built on the work of other people and he took it and built on it and adapted it to its time and spread it with the, word, with the world. And that, I believe, at the moment is our job and our responsibility and it is the best way that we can honor him um i'm going to share i'll ask us lastly if it's okay i will ask you to um share with everybody in the 100 community an email address for how you can keep in touch um it's easy it's skr at nevergray.org um but you can email me there and i would love as i go through these next few months trying to figure out what life means without him um and how best to carry on his legacy. I would love to be in touch with the people um, in this community and you know, in, in the wider community around the world to figure out how together we can, we can best serve his legacy. And there are projects that we're working on. Um, there are projects I was working on with him that I'm determined to finish in his name. But then I think, um, you know, much as I am at the bottom of a mountain of grief, we as humanity are at the bottom of a, of a mountain of collected grief certainly at, at the um 
you know, the activities and the things that have happened this year. But I think also, in, as I said, in the, the things that have led us to this point um, as humanity. And the best way that we can honor dad is to carry his message forward and to create a new reality, to create, to take this opportunity to pause and reset and to create a reality that we're proud to hand over to our children. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for um, for believing in him and for supporting us. And I think together we can make sure that he's never forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for being with us tonight. And uh, on behalf of 100 community, I'm very happy to promise that 100 will keep highlighting the miracle workers around the world which are working to improve the education at scale through the innovations and through the practices and solutions they have created and which are already helping millions of students in, in the classroom today. So we want to bring these people to be known by everyone in the world. And uh, we will also share the email address you mentioned with our community to collect the stories and collect the memories of him. So that will be taken care of. Um, I also want to thank you, uh, all of you, for being with us tonight. Uh, we couldn't have been here without our sponsors. So my special thank yous go to Lego Foundation, uh, helping us to provide this live stream to all of you, but then also to all our other sponsors and part partners we have been working together with during the 2020 and also the next year. Um, tomorrow we have interesting program uh, continuing with the 100 Innovation Summit. Uh, we have Education 2030 session where students are going to grill uh, Andreas Leiche, uh, the director from OECD, man behind PISA tests. Uh, and we are also going to discuss uh, a lot how the education should look for our children, how we are able to keep the promises we have given to them and uh, how we can make the education be even better. But our main program is not only only program we are having for tomorrow. So remember to look our community track, Helsinki education events and everything else what is happening on our Attendify app from masterclasses to icebreakers and to random chat messages uh, with you uh, fellow attendees of the 100 Innovation Summit. So. I thank, you, I thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, I wish you the best of, for the rest of the day and we will meet tomorrow. Sir Ken Robinson has been a huge inspiration for me. Encourage students to go deep into their own creativity. You have inspired me with your clever messages, your creative ideas and new concepts about education. Like many of you, I saw the world's greatest TED talk, um, the school's called creativity. So Ken, you put that into words so beautifully. He taught me about creativity and how the environment and circumstances have to be right. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for his vision for the future of education. Only to mention him as a referent was a sign of quality in no lower presentations from the beginning. His trademark humour gave form and made accessible so many ponderings that were percolating away in my mind and heart. Through his talks, books, I understood the role creativity is playing inside our classrooms and outside it. We met him in 2017 in person. He signed our t-shirts, thanked us for our work as art teachers, and even thanked our son Astor for driving two hours to meet him. If it wasn't for Sir Ken, I'm quite sure I would not be where I am today in an arts integrated school um, in a community arts centre. The role of a creative leader is not to just have all the ideas, but to create an environment where everybody can have ideas and or feel they are valued. As a teacher educator, I am striving hard to create such an environment for my community. His aspirational vision of what teaching and learning should look like emboldened me to start my own education company to push for quality education that celebrates the creative human spirit. Especially his TED Talk, School Kills Creativity, and the book Creative Schools, both 
were instrumental for me to make a decision to enter into education field. Sir Ken, you have always been an incredible inspiration to us and we were lucky to be able to meet you a couple of times at which we asked if you would be willing to write a forward to our book. And collaborating with you and making that happen for real was a tremendous privilege. And the way you endorsed our work, what we do with students and educators around the world, was an incredible honor. His famous quote that education is not a delivery system, but rather an art form has been a great inspiration for me to provide stress-free, play-based and creative learning experiences for children. I remember about a decade ago when I did my first workshop, I used the Changing Educational Paradigms video. And I've used it probably since then in multiple continents and multiple countries as I've done workshops globally. Thank you, Sir Ken Robinson, for your service to education. Thank you for what you have done for education around the world. Merci pour votre service à l'humanité et l'éducation, Monsieur Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ken Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ken. Thank you so much for your service to education, Sir Ken Robinson. We will continue your work to achieve an education that is holistic, that is creative, that smashes the education system we currently have, which is not fit for purpose, and avoid catastrophe. We love you, Ken. Thank you.